to the Create a Movement podcast with your host, Ross Middleton. Hey guys, what's up? We have an awesome interview for you today. This is what has been called the secret sauce of Church United. It is the soul care component, and we will be sitting down with Pastor Brian Brookins, Senior Pastor of Riverside Church in North Lauderdale, who is spearheading the soul care component of Church United. All righty, what's up, everybody? I am sitting here with Brian Brookins, the Senior Pastor of Riverside Church here in Fort Lauderdale. So, Brian, tell me a little bit about yourself. Hello, Ross. Yeah, I uh, pastor Riverside Church here in North Lauderdale. I have been here 30 years. Mm. It's the only church that I've pastored at full time. I am married to an amazing woman, Beth, and together we have six kids, six children. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Six kids. We... We um, we had four kids, and the youngest was five, and we just believed God was, God had something more for us, and we ended up adopting two two boys from West Africa uh, in 2005. They were 12 and nine at wow. the time, and we brought them uh, into our family, and they have been just an amazing gift from God. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So how are you from Fort Lauderdale or are you from somewhere else? I'm really from somewhere else. I was born in Jacksonville and spent my childhood in the Washington, D.C. area in Miami. So South Florida is is really home in many ways, but I've, I've been a little bit all over. So how'd you end up here in Fort Lauderdale? So uh, my dad came to pastor this church back uh, when I was a freshman in college. So for my college and seminary years... I came home to this church. It became my home church. And when I when I completed seminary, uh, got married right around that time, uh, this church called me, called me to come here and work. I, I began working with youth and small groups, doing some teaching. And about two and a half, three years later, they asked me to be the lead pastor. And it's been my story ever since. Wow. that's all. You don't see a lot of guys that have been in one place that long, so that's awesome. It's been a great experience for me to be in the same place, yep. you know, different growth paths for different people, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, this church has been through a lot of change and transition. I, I, I'd like to think it's for the better. We, we've, we sold a building, bought this shopping center that we retrofitted. We felt like it would position us better, not only financially, but also to uh to reach a more diverse congregation a more diverse group of people and and that's been a great journey here in south florida that's really cool all right brian so we're here we're talking about church united and eddie was telling me telling us in this podcast a few podcast episodes ago about the the four pillars that make it up and then the one that he said was the secret sauce the one that was the the undercurrent of all of the church united that makes it all kind of go and that was soul care for pastors so tell me when we say soul care for pastors define that for us a little bit what does that mean Sure. So we accuse Eddie of loving this phrase, secret sauce. This is this <laughs> he, <does. laughs> he loves the secret sauce. Eddie's secret sauce is the phrase secret sauce. Maybe he should work at McDonald's when he gets older. <laughs> I don't know. He obviously uh, has a, a real liking for special sauces. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think what we're trying to say there, but if I could just give an introduction to that whole idea is that we're just convinced that the health of uh, local leadership is the key yeah. to healthy churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that we as a movement, we as a community, we want to bless pastors. So it's just so we, we don't we don't want the local leader, the local pastor to hear us at Church United saying, okay, we're trying to get this from you, or you have an obligation here, or you've got to commit to this, or we're recruiting for that. Um, we really want on the very front end to just come in and serve serve pastors, serve yep. leaders. And uh, so recognizing that, we we felt like, wow, I think, I think that starts with 
just helping pastors to be healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that many pastors are um, experiencing a lot of struggles and they don't always have places to go to get help or to even talk about it or even to relate to other people. I mean, they, they don't have to be in a point of crisis to just sure. just uh, benefit from some companionship and the strengthening that comes out of friendship and relationship and safe places mm-hmm. to process together. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, before, you know, we go too deep talking about soul care, I think, I think some of it is just, just relating, connecting, being friends, helping mm-hmm. one another, uh, a brotherhood in the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so tell me, how did you become the soul care guy? How did you're, you've been, uh, identified by Church United as being the point person for soul care. So you basically get to see the, get a front row seat for all of us pastors and our dysfunction. So how did that, <laughs> yeah. how did you get that, that job? Yeah, that's a great mystery, Ross. I, I don't know. I, th- I think they looked around and said, well, who's the most dysfunctional guy? <laughs> who's the safest guy <laughs> that people will feel free to approach? Um, yeah, I, 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 I I don't really know the answer to that question. I think maybe it's a question that you'd ask um, some some of the the other guys. But um, I'd like to think that thirty years here in South Florida, uh, raising a family here, um, experiencing the challenge of marriage, and then the blessing of God's grace in my own marriage, working with families here building a church here uh, that all of that is in some fashion is it's been the call of God and it has prepared me to just encourage love on mm-hmm. other leaders and to be a part of, of seeing God do a work of grace in, in strengthening leaders here yeah. in South Florida. Yeah. Well, if we're getting the nitty gritty of what it actually looks like and how it fleshes out, why do you think soul care has become why has it become an important aspect of unity here in Broward County in South Florida? What's the impetus behind that? Yeah. So Ross, I think that the, I think that it's pretty, it's pretty clear that there is a very high atrophy rate for leaders, yep. not just in South Florida, right? It's not unique. Uh, it it feels like, and this is not, this is not any kind of data that I can verify for you in this moment. It feels like that's um, accented here, mm-hmm. uh, and um, so we've had some moral failure yeah, uh, some amongst public. leaders, yep. very public. Um, we we we've just seen guys struggling. We've seen the fallout rate. We've seen church planters, for example, really fighting to make it we've seen uh we've seen you know people people really fighting to make it yeah um well i think it's interesting because i know for me personally when i think of you know a unity movement in a city soul cares to be honest would not be the first thing that comes into my mind it really wouldn't i don't know be the second or third thing that comes into my mind it's kind of a you know, which maybe gives Eddie some validity talking about the secret sauce. Uh, but I think it is a really unique approach to bringing unity in the city and bringing that in Broward County, uh, because it's not necessarily, at least in my experience, the most obvious thing that you would do for pastors to build unity among pastors is to do the soul care. It seems yeah. like in a lot of America, a lot of unity is focused on, let's do some events together, some prayer meetings, things like that. And we're actually saying here that what's been the most beneficial in a lot of ways is the soul care portion of the unity. And you know what What might be uh, helpful for us at this point, Ross, is to think about, okay, if, if I go back 30 years in, in what ministry was like, and, and if if I remember getting together with a group of pastors uh, decades ago, there would have been at times a certain dynamic where guys would get together and there would be some, I, I, I don't know, I hate to say it like this, but one upmanship and yep. um, there, there wasn't a little comparison. Yeah. Yep. And there wasn't always this sense of deep camaraderie sure. and, and uh, with a shift that's happened in culture and a feeling that, man, this is, this is, this building the church is not easy stuff and 
guys struggling and 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 it's it's in some ways it's like God has opened a door for greater transparency, uh, a, a freer acknowledgement that we mm-hmm. need one another, that yep. we need God's grace, we need help. Uh, um, I think a little bit of a healthy disillusionment with the celebrity um, approach sure. to leading the church and say, okay, listen, let's let's be about Jesus, let's exalt yep. the Lord, let's help one another. Um, we're in this together. We we stand together. We fall together. Um, so I I think you know if 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 I'm honest about it, I think God's really opening a door, f- uh, a, f- a, a, f- a fresh opportunity for us to work together. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and that's part of the reason we're doing this podcast. I'm going around interviewing people like yourself is because I find what's happening here in Broward County remarkable. Now it's hard for us. We have obviously a somewhat myopic view because we live in this area. And so we don't know exactly what's going on in other cities. But even as I talk to pastor friends of mine in other cities, some of them have good relationships with fellow pastors. When I sometimes speak of what's going on done here, they're almost like, wow, like that's amazing. Some of the things that are, that are happening here. And I, I wondered sometimes being in South Florida, obviously it's very unchurch, and Eddie gave us some great numbers on that, about about 3% you know, evangelical that go to church on Sunday morning in Broward County. And I don't know if it's because of, you know, Eddie was talking about some of the, the public moral failures that kind of woke everybody up a little bit to this issue, uh, or it was just the fact that I don't personally really feel like on Sunday morning we're competing with Riverside Church or Calvary Chapel or City Church, another That's Rio right. Vista right downtown. We're competing with the dolphins and the beach and vacations mm. and yeah. just yeah. the extreme lostness of people that live here. And I, I found that it's almost kind of like, man, there's there's so many people that have such a desperate need. I don't know if it's some of the, the level of kind of desperation that we kind of all feel uh, that kind of drives us to say, man, I think we could probably accomplish a lot more together than we really could if we were living in silos and operating in silos rather than doing something together. But it's kind of interesting to see some of the factors that seems like have kind of brought us together. And so that's why I'm really fascinated, at least especially by this soul care portion of it, because it seems so unique in any sort of unity movement that I've seen or experienced and been in different cities. Yeah, I think those are good observations, Ross. I I think it's um, obviously, um, and, and a number of people have commented on this, the some of the public moral failures kind of brought about a sense of brokenness yep. and maybe maybe prepared the soil but there's 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 something more than that that's happening if if i think of the way that god has orchestrated this movement Mm -hmm. i look at i look at guys like uh doug souder yep right over at calvary fort lauderdale yeah just what what an amazing guy Mm -hmm. i mean he just this a man of god but he does a lot for example to set the tone for soul care Hmm. because he loves people. He's not about just himself or that church Mm -hmm. or he loves, he loves people. He loves other pastors. He loves the lost. And there's, it's just very simple. We, God has brought us people like, like Doug, like Tom Hendricks, like Mm -hmm. John Ellswick, like Roby Barnes, like Isaac Freer, like, I mean, on and on where, there's a genuine care and concern for other people, for other leaders, and for the lost and everything, yep. in, you know, just the whole spectrum. And that's where, th- that's how soul care happens. It's mm-hmm. just about loving people. And once that happens, then then you begin to accumulate and identify resource that can help leaders who are then in turn helping other people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So give us a little bit of a roadmap. Tell us what does this practically look like when we say soul care, kind of defined it a little bit what that means, but when it works out to the praxis of it, how do we actually make this happen? What does it look like here in Broward County? How would you describe that? Okay. So uh, for, for, for soul care to happen, a person has to come out of isolation, has to recognize I need relationship. 
So on one level, it's it's about connecting to other pastors and leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about um, the gospel of Jesus Christ invites us uh, in our brokenness to come and receive help. So those would be foundational components, community, um, receiving the mercy that is ours in Christ, being transparent about our own brokenness, our own need. Um, those are those are biblical values and experiences. On top of that, and I think this is a question you're asking, what's a model then? What yep. does it look like? So I, we, we, are, um, we are starting with a model that Jimmy Dodd provides. My uh, favorite NASCAR driver. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I heard that name and I was like, that guy's got to drive NASCAR at some point in his yeah, life. Yeah, sorry. I'm not, a, I'm not a NASCAR fan. Let's talk golf or football I'm not a NASCAR baseball. fan either, but yeah. I just know a boy named Jimmy Dodd's got to make it to yeah, the turns. Yeah, so... Founder of Pastor Serve, he's written a book, Survive or Thrive. He lays out six roles okay. that a pastor needs. Three professional, three personal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he talks about coaching, counseling, mentoring, training, various roles that um, help help support an individual in terms of his own personal life and ministry. And he, he gives a very helpful paradigm, backstage, front stage. So we have front stage public ministry. We have a backstage mm-hmm. life that yep. supports that. And are they congruent? Mm-hmm. And what's really beneficial about his model is he lays out really a, a comprehensive view of how do you care for these very divergent worlds? And um, and are you are you uh, you know addressing the needs of your own soul, your own public ministry, your own private life? So that's where we started, and and um, we're we're kind of using that model as yep. a, as a paradigm to help guys get care. Our specific. Just to continue in that note for a minute, Ross, our specific strategy yeah. has been to start with um, a cohort where we bring together 12 leaders. We go away with spouses. And these are 12 senior, different senior pastors, Yeah, correct? typically senior, yep. but, you know, we, we want to widen that circle. So in the, in the most recent cohort that we launched, I believe we had two executive pastors. Okay. And we certainly want to make this available for all leaders, mm-hmm. uh, pastors, ministry leaders. But um, just so again, recognizing needs to be a safe place where we're going to be transparent. We need community, and out uh, on that platform, we we will employ this model. So we brought in Jimmy Dodd, mm-hmm. went away with our spouses, twenty four hours. Uh, you know financial resource from generous Christians here in the area and, and ministry partners made this possible. And we laid in that foundation. And then those 12 leaders will meet six times, half day meetings the rest of the year to talk about these six roles. Okay. You know, okay. Is coaching something you've ever thought about? Would it be beneficial to you? Why would a pastor, benefit from counseling yep. uh, who's a mentor in your life and who's helping you navigate through life over the long haul um, and uh, various various components of life professionally and personally to help strengthen and invest in that local leader yeah. no, I think that's amazing I, and, and to me again it's a testimony of the grace of God and the unity that's happening to, th- to get 12 different pastors that maybe only a few miles from each other coming into a small group with their spouses to talk about their struggles and challenges is, I think it's remarkable uh, that we would have something like that and the fellowship that that builds. What do you think have been the biggest walls that have kind of been broken down among, among pastors? What are the things that, why do we as pastors wrestle with that sometimes? Why? I mean, there's definitely a need of, you know, just, everybody's got a little bit of ego or competition in them, but what are, what are the things that have, that have broken down when we have that pastor's not just a name of another church? It's, oh, this is a specific person that I now have fellowship and relationship with. How has that enriched the relationship by doing, doing that over the course of a year? Yeah, so, so the biggest walls mm-hmm. have been, I think... 
theological and historical. So theologically, I think uh, just really believing the gospel, mm-hmm. you know, believing our own brokenness, uh, the the beauty of transparency of of receiving the the grace of God the yep. mercy of God um, the means by which God brings that to us through fellowship in His Spirit and meaningful relationship so you know I think it's just God is removing good old fashioned pride yep. and, the, and and the various devices that we all I mean this is not unique. To sure. Pa- to pastors, yep. right? This is just a human condition, yep. and pastors are not immune. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that that's part of it. And then I think historically, I think um, unity. I think it's the, it's the it's the challenges that face Church United on the whole. Uh, historically, we've tended to be tribal. Yep. We kind of do our we get with our own group, and we're leery of those that are not a part of our own group. I think that's changing. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, a big obstacle for, you know, strong Bible believing leaders is that this has been associated with an ecumenicalism that has tended towards liberalism. Mm -hmm. So right or wrong, um, you know, you you hear unity and you think ecumenical, you think liberal, you think, um, okay, social social justice. Uh, which is great, sure, but not gospel believing. Yeah, and that may be an unfair characterization. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that that's accurate. But it is. I, this is. This has a different feel than mm-hmm. uh, than what we've seen historically labeled as an ecumenical movement. This is a gospel movement, a Christian movement, a Christ centered movement that has spiritual teeth. Yeah, I love the fact that. Even when we're together at our large, large group gatherings once a quarter, and even when I'm in, in my region, the East region downtown, and uh, you know, we always give each other a hard time about our theological differences. Whether someone's a, a credo Baptist or a Pado Baptist that are dunking or sprinkling kids, you know, we we give yeah. each other a hard time yeah. and, and and have fun with it, and it's not something that you know really should divide us. Everybody's got their convictions, and that's fine. Uh, but it's a lot. Of, it actually brings a lot of joy and laughter when guys can actually laugh about stuff and. I think there's a lot of a lot of health in that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Eddie and I were just talking about we have a leadership retreat uh, that's about to take place, and we're going to do a little healthy competition. We we think we're gonna we're gonna separate the 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 Pado Baptists from the <laughs> believer from those who practice believers baptism and and those who you know em, embrace a certain view of the spiritual gifts and those who don't sure. and and just laugh at one another and enjoy the differences because it really, I mean, we say this and I, I, I think now the reality is, is, is really taking hold. There is much more in Christ that unites us sure. than divides us. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think have been the biggest benefits, whether that's a, a personal experience for you or whether that's something that you've had conversations with with other pastors from these cohorts and actually having some intimacy with with these fellow partners and and you know and partners in Christ. What what do you think is one of the biggest benefits to your own heart or to testimonies you've heard from others? Yeah, just that's easy to answer. The the the, the brotherhood, the friendships. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I feel like I'm not alone. Yeah. I there are a number of guys I can pick up the phone right now, and they will do whatever they can to help me. It's awesome. They will pray for me. They are standing with me. So th- there are other benefits that are really significant. Uh, sharing best practices, getting counsel, um, exposure to resources that are really effective. I mean, I have no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that I am much, much more effective as a local pastor because of Church United, mm-hmm. because of soul care, because of the cohorts, because of our larger meetings. Uh, no doubt whatsoever that I'm more effective, that I'm that this church is benefiting. But personally, it's just been tremendously encouraging. Uh, you, you know, there, there was a one of the early presidents of Princeton before it was called Princeton, back when it was a seminary mm-hmm. and training leaders. He said, uh, Christian leaders flourish in clusters. And and 
and uh, you know, Paul in, in Ephesians four tells us to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Yep. And when we are together in Christ, the Holy Spirit unites our hearts, and we experience God's grace. We are strengthened as we are together, yep. uh, focused on Christ. And uh, so that that's what's happening. Genuine relationship and friendships are being formed. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, you get it. There's something about the fellowship of just being with other brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ that could bring a lot of joy. It's not a prayer meeting or a worship night or preaching. There's just something about, hey, I can go and have fun and have a heart connection with someone else and laugh and tell stories. And it actually fills your heart. It brings a lot of, a lot of joy, you know, in the brotherhood. And so I think that's a powerful, powerful aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. What do you think pastors need to do day to day to keep their souls healthy? And why is it so hard for pastors? Why is it so hard for us to take care of our souls? And this is what we get paid to read the Bible, right? I mean, why is this so difficult? Well, that's a million dollar question, uh, Ross. I, I think some of it is the, 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 the very same reason reasons that anyone struggles. We have to we have to rely on the Lord. We have to spend time with him, yep. not not out of a legalistic obligation, but out of relationship, receiving from the Lord, um, from his word, from his spirit, from the spirit of God. Uh, but I do think there's an added reality of uh, warfare mm-hmm. that leaders experience. Sure. And so I think there's that dimension. And I think there's a, there's a tendency and a temptation towards isolation. Mm. Um, it's It shouldn't be there. It's uh, It's based on false presuppositions, but... In our immaturity, we think, ah, oh, you know, I, I lead other people. I need to have it together. Mm-hmm. I need to present myself as having it together. And all that's understandable. But just the spiritual reality is we need, pastors need to be pastored. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, if a pastor is listening to this and they think, I, mean, I, I need some of that, I need the camaraderie, or I may need to see a counselor. What are the what are some of the red flags that would go off in a pastor's heart that would say, "I think I need to talk to somebody about what's going on in my own life." Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, y- you know, um, so learning to identify the signs of you're you're burning out, you're not in a healthy place. Mm-hmm. You're you're unusually impatient. You're easily agitated. Mm-hmm. This uh, what what might be uh, a normal um, occurrence in isolation, or occasionally now it's becoming a lifestyle. Yep. Um, the development of a secret life. You've mm-hmm. got secret struggles that you're not talking to anyone about. Is a huge red flag. Um, Secret sin, um, also um, broken communication with your spouse, Mm -hmm. um, anger and resentment towards other leaders, unresolved bitterness, forget uh, unforgiveness, resentment over past ministry situations. Yep. Yeah. So these are spiritual indicators, both you know, uh, practically, emotionally, along with. You know, an unhealthy. If you're if you're identifying unhealthy fear about finances and health, and these are indicators. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm not in a good place. I'm not in a good place. My marriage isn't a good place. My kids aren't in a good place. Yep. Um, there's not unity amongst my leadership here within the church. Those things should should just be flags. Okay, I'm gonna go get help. I'm mm-hmm. not gonna try to do this alone. And what would be the first step for a pastor? Who would they? Who do they talk to? Do you just look in Google counselors or what is that? What does yeah, that look like? Yeah. I, w- I, w- I wish I <laughs> had a silver bullet to offer you there, Ross. I don't, I don't know that it's the same for every guy. It's, I think that man or woman in ministry has to sit down and say, okay, who, God, who is it that, mm-hmm. that I, wh- where's, where's my first step? You know, um, 
I think at Church United, we want to give some obvious safe places for people to go to. Um, and, you know, you certainly don't, you don't take, you, you don't take the entire step in the first encounter, but yep. I think some exploration, some prayer, um, maybe another pastor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, I appreciate you and your time. I know that I, I've heard that you spend about 10 hours a week, right? Talking about soul care and doing that for pastors here in Broward County. So how did, how did you even get to that point where you realize this is something that I'm going to take about a quarter of my week to spend helping pastor other pastors locally? Well, I, th I think Ross, if, if other pastors heard you say 10 hours is a quarter of my week, they would say, wow, I want that job because none of us feel like we were able to do this in 40 Touché. hours. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I went to my elders and said, I've, I've been asked to do this. Uh, what do you think? And they, I, I have an amazing team here. I'm so grateful. And they said, listen, this is, they, they just immediately embraced mm, this opportunity. Awesome. They said, uh, this is this is kingdom ministry. This is God's will. You know, I think they knew me well. They affirmed that they felt like God would use me in this capacity. But I am just in an amazing church where my leader said we completely support this, and we recognize that we don't know where this is going. We don't mm -hmm. know. We don't know how easily you'll manage 10 hours and what the ramifications of that yep. are going to be. So we're going to just walk it out with you and you have our support and we're doing it together. That's yeah. And, uh, so, uh, putting together, uh, the, 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 uh, aspects here locally at Riverside so that nothing's neglected, mm -hmm. you know, at home or in ministry or here in the County. And, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Learn as we go, right? Yeah. Build the plane in the sky. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Appreciate your time. You are and welcome. And hanging out. And hopefully some of the other pastors that are listening to this are blessed and encouraged. And hopefully those that may have some of those red flags right now going off in their heart, will maybe this will be the impetus to them stepping out, going to see somebody or talk to somebody. That sounds good. Thank you. Man, what a cool interview with Pastor Brian Brookins, getting to hear about the heartbeat behind soul care and the important role that it's playing in a united ecumenical movement. Man, I hope it challenges you. I hope it gave you some new and fresh ideas and some things that you could take to your city or your church to be a blessing there. God bless you guys. We'll see you in the next episode.